On Tuesday, we started more concretely to work toward our project. We started this login screen setup. We're still a ways from that, but that's what we're continuing with today to make this log in, log out system. The way I'm going to work with my code is on my flash drive. I've got a folder for this class, and I've got the CBDB folder. The way I'm going to do it, the way I usually do it, is I make a copy of my work and put today's date. So I have a copy from last time, in case I need to go back to the old version of the code. We're not really doing any version control here. Maybe we should use GitHub or SVN or something. But to keep it simple, that was what I did on Tuesday. I'm going to copy that folder. If you don't know this trick in, in Windows, you can right-click and hold and drag, and you get a pop-up menu where you can copy the folder. You can do a copy and paste, sure, but here I'm doing the right-click, um, drag, down, and select copy, so that I can make a copy of what we did on Tuesday, and I'll put today's date on it. Every day at the beginning of the day, I will make a copy. Now, you could also get a copy of that from the network folder. So, if you choose to use my code, that's fine too. In the network folder, in the campus mad one, you will see um, a folder with Tuesday's date. So you can either simply get a copy of my folder, or work with your files, or get them both. But I would recommend you make a copy of your folder to leave alone the one you did last time, in case you need to go back to your previous code. So that could be another way to do it. I'm going to copy from the network folder, uh, Tuesday's folder, put it on my flash drive, and then I'm going to put today's date on it, and we'll get started. So I copied from the network folder 620, and I put today's date 622. So make sure you've got a, a copy of the work, and we'll go on. Uh, where did the uh, sign-in sheet go around to the pink sheet? <coughs> So you need a copy of the project with today's date. What's that? In the network folder? So you just don't see the 22? There is no 22. You copy the 20 and then you put today's date on it. Because today, when I'm done with today's work, I'm going to put a copy of 622. And that was got 622. <coughs> All right, so I've uh, got myself set up. Uh, you uh, will have some sort of workflow that you'll be used to, but that's my workflow. I'm going to copy the folder from the network folder from last time to my flash drive and put today's date. And when I'm done for the day, I'll put a copy of my finished work back to the network folder. So you can, get, you can always have a copy of my code. Ultimately, then, we should be in sync about what kind of code we're working on. So in uh, the project folder, it's going to change every time we're here. So I'm not going to refer to it by date every single time. The project folder. 
in the project folder. Uh, let's go ahead and open the index.html. You want to right-click it and select uh, Edit with Notepad. And then you also want to open the index.js file. So open both the HTML file and the JS file in the scripts folder. So in your scripts folder, you'll also find index.js. You want to right-click, edit with Notepad++. So I've got both the index file and the JS file open. Each one has its own tab. Those are the two files you want. In Notepad, we can look at two uh, files at once. I mentioned it briefly last time. I'll mention it again because it's useful. If you wanted to look at both the index and the JS file at the same time, you can right-click the tab of one of the files, right-click the tab, and then you have Move to Other View. This will create a split-screen view, so you can look at both at once. You can right-click it again and move to Other View, and it goes back. You also have the ability right-click clone to other view that um, ha here, for example, I've got the index file open and the index file open. The reason I may want to clone a view is because I may want to look at a certain part of one file and another part of the same file. Sometimes I'm referring to code at the end of a file and at the beginning, so if I clone the view, right-click clone view, you can see the beginning and the end at the same time of the same file. You've also got, if you do right-click, you've got Move to New Instance, Open a New Instance. Uh, what's the difference between the two? Well, I usually do mo Move to New Instance, and that opens it in a brand new, completely different window. So what you could do with that is put your windows side by side, however you want to manage your workflow. I'll usually just have one file open at a time because my screen isn't as, as ample as yours, so I'm usually focusing on one file. To remind ourselves uh, how far we went, you want to run your index.html file, and then we'll get started writing new code. I'm going to run the index file, doesn't matter which browser, I'm just going with Firefox, it's the first one. Although, a little bit later, we'll probably be focusing on Chrome, because I like its uh, mobile device detection, or its mobile device emulation features better. Launch in Firefox. We, we need to get used to start uh, our uh, our console, our developers panel. We want to get used to opening that up as soon as possible. Now that we're going to deal with JavaScript and other advanced features, we want to check our console right away. On a Mac, F12 is usually reserved to like you know lower the volume or something. So there is there is going to be a function tied to it, uh, but I think if you press something like Command F12, it'll do it, or maybe Option so you have F12. To, you have to remap the key. Yeah. You might have to remap the keys, yeah. You are also able to right-click and select uh, Inspect Element, and that will also open the panel. All right, so uh, this loads up. I get the ready to rock message because that's simply saying that on line five of my index.js file, I made a console log output. If you click sign up, it takes you to the sign up screen. Remember, we played with this that if you just fill this out with some values, click go, I get the start the FN sign up, and then I've got an error message which we'll deal with right now. But this is as far as we've gotten. But we've done a lot. We've created a couple of screens, a sign up, uh, a welcome screen, a login screen, a sign up screen. We've started to touch on the JavaScript that will make this work. So we're just going to continue then in the index.js file. What we last ended up with 
What's that? Question? So we've got the uh, event handler here. We've created a JavaScript object for the form. Once this form is submitted, we run a function. Function sign up. It is up there. So it's simply a little bit of output that says start the fn sign up function. Now the reason we're getting that error, um, you know, Firefox gives you one version of the error and Chrome will give you another. This one says, okay, XML parsing error, syntax error, location, blah, blah, blah. If I run it in Chrome, it gives me a slightly different kind of error. Um, and the purpose of that is, the reason uh, for that error is, it's, um, let me just pull up the error to show you. It's trying to tell us we're trying to do a, um, an action that usually is not secure. Okay, Chrome, for example, it says H, XML HTTP requests cannot load, blah, blah, blah. Core, uh, cross origin requests are only supported in HTTP data, Chrome, Chrome extension, HTTPS. So it says, okay, you're trying to submit a form that might not be secure. So the default behavior of submitting the form is it's trying to connect to another server, basically another origin, to process the form. That's the default behavior. To fix this, we'll add to our code in the index.js function sign up event dot prevent default capital D. We're running this function which was invoked by clicking submit. The default behavior of submit is to try to connect to a server to send an email or whatever. We're not trying to do that. So we're trying to prevent the default behavior. We've passed the event variable into the function which is found right here. Submit the form, run a function, passing through an event into a function the, on the event of us trying to submit it, basically. Let's prevent the default behavior. If you run it now, you shouldn't be getting that message about cross-origin or XML poorly formed and such. So save it and run it, test the form, that error should go away. just say start sign up. That error that was there was, again, for security purposes, and we've nullified that. We're preventing the default behavior, and that's fine, because we're going to make this form do something besides what the intended point of it was originally, which was to send an email. You should not get those errors in Chrome or Firefox anymore. Okay, so the way this form works is a person types in an email and a password confirmed twice and more stuff happens. Possibilities of happening are you typed two different passwords. Passwords don't match. Another possibility is that account already exists. A couple of errors, right? And what's the third possibility perhaps of a success? brand new account. So great, let's save that account and proceed for us to log in. We need to capture what the person has typed into those fields, <clears throat> these three fields. When they click go, we need to capture what's in there. So inside of the function, we will create variables to hold the values of what people have typed in there. We're going to use jQuery syntax to check what's in those boxes and store them. jQuery syntax with the dollar symbol. We will call this 
el element in email sign up is an element for the input of our email sign up screen because we're going to have a sign in screen or a login screen and a sign up screen equals jQuery selector to find those boxes so dollar symbol parentheses in quotes pound sign all of those boxes have an ID so we're going to refer to them with via their ID which should be in email sign up you can confirm that by looking at your HTML file and make sure that those input fields well this input field has an ID equal in email sign up Here. So in the HTML file, the input box has a name and an ID. That's how we're finding that HTML node via JavaScript. Go find the HTML node with that ID and store a reference to it in this variable. Comma. I also want to create an element for the input of password in the sign up field. Why is it Why is what? Why is it a I'm about to explain in a moment. And as well, pound in uh, password sign up. And comma, one more. L in password confirm sign up, go find me the element with an ID of in, password, confirm, sign up, and then semicolon. Every command we've done so far basically has ended in a, in a semicolon, end of statement. Here I've done three things at once. I've started to create a variable, one variable, comma, and create another variable, comma, and create another variable, the end, semicolon. So I created three variables at once with that comma. The long way to type that would be that each of these needed to say var l in email, semicolon, var l in password sign up, semicolon, var l in password confirm, semicolon. I would have to type var each time terminate each statement, semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. This is equivalent to doing that, and you save a few bytes. Similar to CSS that you can sort of chain things together. So notes here will say create three, jQuery uh, variables to hold the uh, input field nodes So again, obviously, I have this all planned out, and we're all going toward a goal. But if you were doing this on your own and trying to figure out what should I do, what should I type, how should I do it, it's a very good idea for yourself uh, to do a lot of console log output to kind of check, am I on the right track? Did I actually capture the text? Instead of trying to figure out, well, why doesn't my if-else statement work? Oh, I never captured the right uh, node. So I'm going to do these very often console.log. I want to output what I think I captured. So dollar $l in email. Basically each of those variables we just created. Comma. Also output L in password. You should see what I'm getting at here. Password sign up. I keep trying to write sing up instead of sign up. 
comma l in password confirm sign up. So this console output, this is for me to tell myself, am I on the right track? Because remember I said we can have uh, syntax errors, we can have logic errors. Right now, up to this point, probably we don't have any syntax errors. We've probably typed the JavaScript correctly, but we could have logic errors in that I'm using the selector to select the wrong input box. Maybe I'm trying to select the input box from some other screen and not this screen. So to try to avoid the logic errors, it helps me at least to do console log output to see if I'm on the right track. Spelling wise, what I would re recommend also, you can select any variable or keyword or whatever, you can select it by double clicking it, and it should also select it other spots that it exists. That's another way because if I, I, I said I keep seeing myself accidentally typing sing up instead of sign up, it looks like I typed it all right, but if I select the word there, oops, that does not highlight here and here, and I see sign up, sing up. Okay. So take that, take advantage of that. Select your words, and it should then highlight the other instances. Brackets, brackets, sort of yes. If you click, for example, this opening bracket, it will highlight and find its pair. I mean, brackets. Oh, uh, the brackets editor. Um, not every editor has every single one of these. I see things in brackets that I like there that are not here, <coughs> and I see things in Notepad that are not in other software. Now, what, what doesn't work, unfortunately, is it will not pay attention to case. So here, if my variable, I created it up there, line 18, capital U, and down here, I used it as lowercase u. Here, it makes it look like, oh, they're the same. No, Notepad doesn't differentiate between uppercase and lowercase, unfortunately. So that looks like it's the same variable, but it's not, because case sensitivity does matter. To test if this works, save it and run it. Fill some things in those boxes and click Go and check your output, check your console. It should then tell you what you just typed into those boxes. Let me confirm that mine works. So I'm going to refresh it, sign up, type some stuff, click go, and I see right here. It's showing me that I did capture these objects, the in email sign up, the password, the confirm. is showing me, yeah, you selected the right node, and we've shown it. Technically, it's showing us the whole node. It's showing us too much. It's showing us the HTML stuff that we don't need. It's showing us some CSS stuff that we don't need. I only need what did the person type in that field. See here, it's saying, okay, there you've got an object. It's an input with that ID, with that length, and this context, and this, and this, and that. I don't need that. I just need what did they type? What's the value of what they typed? So we need one more thing here. We've got this object, which is a representation of that input, the whole input, literally that whole input box. We need also dot .val. We've got an object and a method. Here's the object that we're capturing using a method. Give me the value of what they typed in that box. Give me a value of what they typed in that box and give me the val value of what they typed in that box. So add dot val parentheses to each one of those three objects, to these each of those three variables. I forgot to bring my book today, but uh, the book that I recommend has a list of all of these possible 
methods, all these possible commands. Right now, I'm checking what's the value of what they typed. I could check how long of a value they typed. Oftentimes with a password, it asks you, make sure you, you fill in a password with at least eight characters. Right now, we don't have that functionality. Via jQuery and JavaScript, we could check what is the dot length of what's been typed in there. Then if it's if length is less than eight, give a message that says make sure your password doesn't longer than eight characters. But this is one possible method. Dot val value. If you run that, type some values in there, click go. Now it should see a little bit more manageable. Your email was this, comma, your first password was that, comma, your second password confirmation was that. You know, if I type something else here, the password was that, the first uh, the email was that, the first password was that, the confirm password was that. Let me check you w one moment. So that's what we're trying to get there. Yeah, I mean, if you're on like certain websites, you can just pull that up for just in general. Like, you mean seeing those values for other people's websites? Yeah. No. If I was like Amazon and logged in, and I could, would it show me the values of the password and everything? Not quite, because we are uh, we're, we're running with our own code, and we're making our own code, and we can see that. Amazon most likely would not be doing console output right there for everyone to see. Uh, but anyway, you would only be seeing your password. You're trying to log into Amazon, console output will tell you your password, not everyone's password. Right, so I'll be like, if I got on like, this computer, it it's, it's impossible, but I think Amazon has pretty good security, so they probably thought about it.
All right, so what we've got here is the ability to collect what the person has typed into those fields. So we reference the field and we do dot val to check what they've typed. Once we're able to see that, we can make choices. We can have it check things. One of the first things I wanted to check is, are the passwords the same? We're trying to do this confirm password. You guys in the back question? Okay. What we're trying to do here is confirm that the password and the password confirm are the same. So new line, I'm still inside of the function of sign up. And before I go further, because the function sign up is going to have a lot of, a lot of um, lines, I'm going to give myself a note at the end of that curly brace that this is end, fn sign up. When I browse my hundreds of lines of code, I'm going to lose track. What does that close? What is that? Giving myself a little note tells me that's the end of a function that I'll find a hundred lines up. So that's totally optional. It's a comment, but I like to do that. Because the next line after this console.log back inside of the function is I'm going to do use something known as a conditional statement if else like this. Notice the syntax. This is to make a decision. This is why I said let's make a comment right here because you're going to see this one and this one together at one point and forget why do I have two of those? Well this one ends the function and this one ends the if else. You could comment that as well. I would say yes as a beginner and if else. That's the end of my if else. What's that? Lines are no parentheses. This is a comment. It doesn't matter what I write. No, no, no. I'm sure else. Else doesn't have a parentheses. It's uh, it's the final possibility of a of a possibility that we could have. So it, the syntax is no parentheses on else. So if else is to make a decision. Here we have two possibilities. If else uh, checks for two, only two possibilities. We have other ways to check for three possibilities, or 300 possibilities. Right now we just have to check for two. Do the passwords match? Yes or no? That's all we need to do. Nothing much more complex. So an if-else statement will let us check for that. Yes or no? Do they match? If part <coughs> checks for true or false of something. If true, do part in the first pair of curly braces. If false, do the part in the second pair of curlies. If the passwords match, true, 
do stuff here. We're basically asking, do the passwords match? True. Do the following. Do the passwords match? False. Do that. That's how we can make a simple decision. If else statements are very common in most programming languages. Question. Uh, when you use this type of information in the banking system and some secure, it doesn't give you many options, many times. Just two times mm -hmm. if you do it, then they block yes. your account. If we're if you're if you're about to ask if we're gonna do that, no. But we should do that. However, it's gonna be more complex for the moment. No, I, I don't want just I want uh, to clear myself. Here is hundred million times we can yeah. check different passwords. You could, yes. Which is not secure. Uh, so that's true. We should set it up a way that it only gives you three tries. Um, and we might have that a little later, but that's good to think about because if someone can check multiple times, they can break your password. They can guess your password. And there are some ways when you want to put your password, they ask you some hint. Yes. That's another system that definitely could be no, useful to make it even more. Go to other systems. Just there are some systems, for example, for the computers, mm -hmm. desktop, laptop. And you want to get in, maybe you forget it. There is no way. There is some hint. Mm -hmm. You must put it before for your password. Yeah, a hint system to help you um, to log in. That's pretty useful. So what we're checking here is do those two passwords up there match? So in the if parentheses, we'll say dollar in or dollar l in uh, password sign up dot val. We'll write this for the moment and then I'll explain it. L in password confirm. Those are two equal signs, no space. Previously we've used the equal symbol, which is basically basically take the thing on the right and put it into the thing on the left. A plain old one equals. It's an assignment operator. We're assigning um, the value here on the right to the object on the left. So in most programming languages, a single equal, take the thing on the right, put it into the thing on the left. In most programming languages, when I want to check for equality, does one equal one? Equality. When I want to check for equality, it's a double equals. You can't see it on my font really here, but there is two equals here. Yes? Do the spaces matter here between the parentheses and the yeah, spaces? Like all of that right there? No. In this case, you could have the spaces and all of that, although you do definitely need a s no space there. Actually, I think you don't want a space there. You, I believe you, you need to keep that together. Yes? This is not if-then condition. It's sort of an if, sort of if then, but yeah. JavaScript calls it if else. If not or if then, because if not, if then, it's going to send this is wrong password. Mm -hmm. Yes, this will be. Other languages would be if then, but here we've got if else. If true, do the following. Then, if it's false, do the following. So true versus false. Just so different if terms. Else is the same as if then? Pretty much in JavaScript. That's how they've chosen to do it. There's no if then, there's if else. So here we're trying to say if the passwords are equal, do the following, or else they're not equal, so do the following. Now, uh, when you deal with this logic of true or false, it's simply true or false. The password is either both the same or they're or they're both not the same. You're either true or you're false. So that's how computers think. Computers can only deal with true or false, yes or no, zero, one, on or off. Binary, that's the big thing about computers. These advanced systems, deep down, it's binary, zeros and ones, true or false. So we are checking true or false. And we can check multiple conditions in other ways. But this is just two possibilities, true or false. The way I want to think about it is I want to deal with what if they're not 
true? What if they're not equal to each other? Right here we're checking. Let's check. Are they equal to each other? And that's a way to do it. But the way I want to do it is, let's check that they're not equal to each other. If they're not equal to each other, do these things. Or else, they must be equal to each other, so that we'll do some other things. So perhaps logically we're doing it a little bit backwards, but it's still the same sort of thing, true or false. Exclamation point equals equals, that means not equal to. Exclamation point is not. Check if both passwords are not, which is equal, which is exclamation point equals equals. Check if both passwords are not equal to each other. So in this instance, in this case, everything that happens here deals with, with mismatched passwords, and everything here deals with matched passwords. And we could do it the other way about equals equals, then everything that happens here deals with matched passwords, everything here deals with mismatched passwords. You could do either way, yeah. Um, we will do them both ways at different times throughout the app, just because logically sometimes it makes more sense to check for something being wrong than something being right. So all I want to do here, console output for the moment. Passwords do not match. Console log. Passwords do match. Save it and run it. Fill in an email. Put in two passwords that match. You know, AA. Uh, and see your console. Put in two passwords that don't match. Put an AA on one and BB on the other. Try to trigger each of these possibilities. This is us. This is us testing it. This is us beta testing it. This is us, this is us alpha testing it. So we don't do any code in else. The JavaScript already knows that else will be automatically. Opposite. Pretty much, yes. Else is in if all else fails. If this part is false, it failed. So if all else fails, do the rest. It just automatically goes to it with two possibilities in this case. All right, so if we run this and we try to get some result, I'll put AA password and AA confirm, click go. Passwords to match, line 32. I'm confirming that with my previous console output. Again, sometimes I'm, I'm a little too verbose with console. I like to use console a lot to test myself every step of the way. I see here that the passwords match, but I'm also confirming via the if-else. If it's a password that is different, you should then get passwords do not match. Uppercase, lowercase, uh, uppercase, lowercase, at the moment, does matter. If you put capital double A and capital and lowercase double A, they do not match. Lowercase A is different from uppercase A. We'll deal with that possibility in a moment. But here we've got an if-else statement to check two possibilities. Let's say people try to type in the passwords, they don't match. You often see that when someone tries to log in and their passwords don't match, the password fields get, get, uh, get reset. You know, wrong passwords, try again. So we'll have a console output for us that the passwords don't match. But I also then want to clean out those input fields. So the input fields are L in password, sign up. This time I want to say dot val quotes. 
no space between them. We can use dot val to read the value of an input field, and we can use dot val to set the value of the input field. If we type something into it, we will put that into the input field. I've got here an opening and a closing quotes with nothing in the middle. That will then effectively clean out that input field and reset it. Reset the input to an empty. I want to do the same thing for the confirm password. L in. Make sure you spell these things right. Password. Confirm. Sign up. Dot val. Quotes to be empty. Let's set the value of these inputs to empty. No spaces are just totally empty. We set those to empty. Wrong password, we set them to empty. There's, of course, many ways that we can handle this. You've seen examples on many other websites. You may get, you know, other ways. They're, they're all valid. Depends on how much we want to code this, because when we see someone else's website or app, it works perfectly. Guess what? That was hundreds of hours of making it work perfectly. We spent a few hours so far this far, we're this close to getting it finished. No, actually, we're this close. Uh, we still have a while to do. So do we want to figure out every possibility? We can, we should, of course. But that's what you have to think about. You as the programmer now, you have to figure all of this out. If you run this, if you test it, you should simply see that a moment ago when I typed mismatched passwords, they stay there. But now if I try to use mismatched, that's two characters as three characters, they clear out. I saw A and triple A do not match, and they clean out. So that's a little bit of user feedback. Passwords don't match clear them out. More user feedback. Right now, only us, the developer, is seeing the console output. The regular person is not going to ever open the console. They don't know what it is. For us, we look at our console all the time now. Well, for the user, we want a message visually on the screen to tell them passwords don't match. Didn't we set up a few pop-up messages before? Passwords don't match. We created some divs in the HTML file for pop-ups. So now we'll take advantage of them. Now we'll load those pop-ups. Those error messages we created in the HTML file, let's use them. Let's make them pop up when it's the wrong password. Okay, so some console output for ourselves, clean those passwords out, let's make the pop-up pop up that has the appropriate message. Dollar symbol, this is the jQuery selector. So the jQuery selector, we're going to uh, select the pop error sign up mismatch. This is the ID of the div that we created in the HTML file. So we've got the dollar symbol, we've got the jQuery selector, pound sign, so that's the reference to the, uh, the pop-up in the HTML file. Dot pop-up method. Prepare a pop-up message. We have to prepare it first, and then it actually pops up. This line, I'll copy it and paste it the same. So we've got a div that we're ready to pop up. To actually pop it up, we then have to say inside of the pop-up method open. 
So we need to prepare it to pop up, and then we actually open it. And here we can have some options, the animation of it, the position of it, that sort of thing. Comma, space, curly braces. We'll open a pop-up and we'll specify a few options in those curly braces. In quotes, position, lowercase p, position, to uppercase t, colon, quotes, open, So here's an option. We'll make a pop-up happen, and its position will be relative to what originally opened it. We can have it open in the center of the screen, at the top of the screen, at the bottom, but the position is relative to what clicked it to open it. Comma, quotes, transition. Not data transition, just transition. Colon, quotes, uh, flip. It's a very specific syntax. This you can get it all from the jQueryMobile.com site. This is one that I put together for us that will uh, make a little flip animation and make that pop up appear um, in the position of the button that opened it, the go button. To open a pop up, position it to the button, basically, and flip it into view. So now people will see the message. Because that console output was just for us. I've tried it a couple of ways, and it often works best if you do prepare it first, and I believe the specification recommends you prepare it first. So I would just have that first one there to get it ready, and then actually pop it up. But it would work without It could. All right, so if I check the result in the browser, I'll put in a mismatched password. Pop up, it flipped into view, passwords don't match. If I click outside of it, it'll unflip. I put in the same password. I don't get a message yet. It's still in only in my console. We have a success message that we'll do in a little bit. You see here how we have to build all of this functionality. We have all of these puzzle pieces that we put together to, to make it work. So why do we have to put it twice? One with empty, like one with code and ready for Well, uh, that was the same question a moment ago. So prepare a pop-up message. The specification basically says you should do it this way to prepare it. Uh, it seems that we can leave it out and it might work, but I would rather follow the specification where it says you should do it this way. This is one of the ones that, looking at jQueryMobile.com, it basically says do it this way, and I say, okay, great, I'll do it this way. Okay. So we shouldn't really get into it, how it works. This is, uh, exactly, this is, this is the way to do it, so we should do it. Now, uh, yeah, a lot of these sort of commands we don't quite need to know exactly how they all work. We just need to know how they work for us and then use them. Okay, so let's pause at this point. We'll check that our code works. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
and then we'll go on at 7.12, we'll come back at 7.22.